Okay, so we're going to move into a really exciting session, uh, Precision Monitoring and Treatment. And uh, this, this uh, section will be led by uh, our colleague Jason Lee. Uh, Jason is the Deputy Director of the Molecular Imaging Program here at Stanford and has expertise in multimodal uh, imaging techniques, uh, especially PET, CT, and optical uh, techniques. Uh, Jason got his BS degree in electrical engineering at UCLA uh, and then a PhD at UCLA in the molecular uh, and medicinal uh, imaging program. Jason, it's all yours. Thank you, Joe. And so we'll start off with uh, presentations from four of our speakers, uh, followed by a panel discussion with them as well and Q&A session. So our first speaker is uh, Andrew Lacey, who is uh, CEO of Prenuvo and a product technologist at heart with extensive experience taking transformative digital products from conception to launch in startups uh, and large corporations. He co-founded Tapulos, a company that pioneered the iPhone mobile revenues, revenues mechanics that now underpin app stores. Um, and their product, TapTap Tap Revenge, was the most popular iOS program in the world in 2010. Uh, it was acquired by Walt Disney Company as a wholly owned subsidiary in 2010. And prior to that, he was at Zap Travel, um, where he built and commercialized Alexa and Siri-like Vertigo search engines or interfaces uh, predating the launch of those, those uh, programs. And he holds an MBA from Stanford and a JD from University of Melbourne. Please welcome Andrew Lacey. Well, hi everyone, it's really great to be here and great to be back at my alma mater. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, and I'm here to talk a little bit about uh, the state of whole body MRI and what we believe that might mean for the future of precision medicine. So uh, in the, I think, 12 minutes that I have, I want to give a quick overview of whole body MRI, um, talk a little bit about some of the current challenges and limitations uh, that we're looking to overcome. Uh, because AI is a very topical, um, it's very topical these days. I want to talk about what AI means in the context of whole body screening. And in particular, talk a little bit about how large data sets can really help our, our understanding of early disease progression. And then finally, tie this back to what it means for precision medicine. So screening in general is a very controversial topic, um, as we would all know. And a lot of that con controversy comes from CT-based screening that started probably 15 to 20 years ago. In fact, 20 years ago, you could go to a shopping center and find a company that would do CT screening. Now this was bad for any number of reasons, um, obviously involved radiation, but most importantly CT being not very good at uh, evaluating soft tissue led to both false negatives and uh, a lot of indeterminate uh, findings or false positives. Uh, that died away, um, although the, I guess like the stain of it did not so easily. Uh, about 10 to 15 years ago, we started to look at, at MRI MRI overcame two of the biggest limitations of CT screening, which was that it did involve radiation and it was quite good at evaluating soft tissue. The problem was it's a slow modality. And because it was a slow modality, clinicians really had one of two choices. If you want diagnostic quality images, put someone in a machine for two to three hours. Uh, or if patients aren't willing to do that, which most people aren't, uh, take images that aren't clinical diagnostic quality. And so the world sort of bifurcated at that point. Uh, institutions like Stanford that have large populations of um, high-risk uh, uh, patient populations with genetic uh, cancer predisposition sy syndromes would put people in MRI machines with uh, general anesthetic for two or three hours. And then out there in the outside of academic institutions, we would typically image people with non-diagnostic sequences. So those trade-offs still led to a large number of indeterminate findings. The approach that we have been using at Pranuvo now for uh, almost 10 years is, uh, is an approach that's based in using dedicated advanced hardware that's purpose-built for screening, um, building uh, sequences that make appropriate trade-offs between time in machine, quality of the imaging, and heat in the body. And we're now at a point where we're able to actually acquire uh, clinical quality imaging um, across the entire body in a single sitting, so around 55 minutes. And our belief is that this helps us overcome some of the earlier limitations and get an appropriate trade-off between the high sensitivity of MRI but still maintaining high specificity, specificity um, that these multi-parametric techniques that we're using really enable us. So 
Amongst those multi-parametric techniques, one in particular is really, really important in the field of screening, and that's diffusion-weighted imaging. Traditionally, when it comes to identifying early solar lesions, there were really two approaches. The first approach is PET-CT, and here we're looking at identifying the high metabolism of tumors, cells that are growing and dividing fast, and through injecting patients with uh, radioactive glucose, we're able to see where that gets taken up by the body. Uh, the second approach is contrast-based approaches, where we're looking for the vascularity that tumors promote around them, and we're able to identify malignant tumors that way. What diffusion enables us to do is actually uh, leverage the fact that these fast-growing solar tumors have a higher cellular density. And that higher cell cellular density restricts the free flow of fluid, and this diffusion-weighted imaging is measuring es essentially the restricted diffusion of fluid. And so that shows up as signal. And of these three techniques, what's really promising and exciting about this one, in particular, obviously, it's the only technique that doesn't involve radiation, doesn't involve injection of any sort of contrast agent, and therefore we believe it's very, very, it's the only technique that really makes sense for longitudinal screening year after um, year. This is not, these are not techniques that we have invented. In fact, in the last 10 years, there's been a steady growth in papers evaluating diffusion techniques in the field of oncology, both for primary lesion detection and also for discrimination, benign versus malignant lesions. And some of those experts in this field actually are here at Stanford. Uh, and increasingly, these papers are showing that with the right equipment, and this is very important, and the right training, diffusion-based techniques can uh, be equivalent to and in some cases exceed uh, uh, PET-CT or uh, contrast-based techniques. So it's a very promising time to be in this field. When we put all this together, multi-parametric MRI plus diffusion, we can essentially create decision trees for lesion discrimination. So based on how the lesion looks, the signal intensity on these different sequences that we're taking, we can build sort of a tree um, where we can classify lesions into something that might be benign, like a cyst or hemangioma, or something that's much more concerning that we would then need to do additional follow-up. Last year, we published a paper uh, together with some other researchers over in Europe. The paper was titled Oncologically Relevant Finding Reporting and Data System, so Oncorads. And the idea here is to take those, that classification approach and develop classification standards for every organ in the body in a screening context. And so we've developed a risk stratification approach by organ uh, for both general population and also for a high risk population. So what are the barriers as it stands today for more widespread adoption of whole body MRI? The first and most important one is hardware. The typical replacement cycle of MRI is something like 15 to 20 years. The MRIs, in fact, I think at Stanford are in the middle of the hospital, and so even replacing them involves shutting down big parts of um, often uh, a hospital itself. And so out there in clinics and in hospitals, we have a wide range of hardware and the overwhelming majority of the hardware is unable to do this diffusion imaging that's the backbone of screening. At the same time, we're in the process of building standards so that as institutions would like to understand and perhaps apply whole body screening in the context of either at risk or general populations, that there's a much better general understanding of what type of equipment is appropriate for this screening. The second is uh, signal heterogeneity. So, MRI is a qualitative imaging modality, unlike, for example, PET-CT or FDG-PET, where you have standard uptake value, something that you can measure that is machine independent and longitudinally consistent. Uh, with MRI, we have seen vastly different signal-to-noise profiles for two machines that are the same model, manufactured by the same manufacturer, one after the other, and the signal-to-noise properties are completely different. And so there's a lot of work and effort that needs to be done to take this qualitative field and make it quantitative. And that's very important in particular for longitudinal MR. Uh, and there's an international group here in the US uh, called Kiva that's working to establish these standards. Uh, and we're part of that group. The third thing, and this is important, and this was sort of the basis of the oncology paper that we wrote last year, is that the sorts of reading standards that are appropriate in a diagnostic setting when someone appears with symptoms are different to the reading standards that need to be applied in the context of asymptomatic screening. And it really requires a big shift in mindset that's quite difficult for radiologists as individuals and institutions as a whole. And um, 
And again, I refer folks to that paper to perhaps, uh, you know, which has a discussion of some of these, uh, these limitations uh, that we see as we started to reach out to folks in different uh, health institutions. And then the last is just more evidence is required. So there's really been no clinical trials um, with sufficient power to really evaluate sensitivity and specificity of whole body screening. This is not unexpected. Uh, those trials are going to require a lot of data and necessarily a lot of time. And it's worth reflecting back on mammogram, which is now standard of care and took something like 40 or 50 years from the time it was clinically proven to the time it started to become adopted. There was enough data that we could really sort of establish that. We hope it's not going to take as much time uh, in, this, in, in the case of whole body screening. And to aid that, we're actually kicking off a really large scale trial in Boston this year. Uh, we talked about the Framingham Heart Study. We hope that also by tracking people using whole body MRI, yeah, year in, year out, we're able to actually Hopefully, this, will be, this data will become a rich sort of vein for identifying new biomarkers or identifying disease processes early. And, um, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the papers that we've already written um, based on very early evidence. So let's talk about AI in the context of um, whole body MRI. So when a lot of people think about AI, they're mainly thinking about diagnostic MRI, so training models to do what the radiologist does, which is diagnose disease. There are, in fact, tons of unique challenges, AI challenges, in the field of whole body MRI simply because we're trying constantly to speed up acquisition, to enhance image quality, to register these multi-parametric sequences to each other. Um, there's a lot of interesting um, uh, foundational steps, like being able to evaluate whether someone is normal or not normal, detect anomalies, and then eventually get to diagnostic um, models. And in the context of us working across all of these, we got really excited about the role of quantification. Um, and in fact, looking at AI is something that not, doesn't take away work necessarily from radiologists, but supercharges them. And supercharges them in the context of being able to identify very subtle changes in human physiology from one year to the next that are impossible for a radiologist to identify with their own eyes. Um, and if we can do that, can we identify disease early? And if we can identify disease earlier, does that make other uh, treatment approaches um, either more successful or more relevant or even just lifestyle risk modification. And if we can do this across many of the conditions that we can see with MR in the body, can this lead to an improvement in, in lifespan and health span over time? Some examples of this. So uh, we have been looking a lot at brain volume. Uh, we do a sequence on all of our patients that is typically done on an advanced Alzheimer's uh, cohort. And now we've collected for sure the largest collection of quote unquote normal brains uh, in the world. Of course, most things in a health system are normal until they're very abnormal. Um, and here, what we're able to see are very subtle changes in brain volume and perfusion and cortical thickness that we believe uh, over time will help enable us identify uh, mild cognitive decline a lot earlier and at times when lifestyle interventions can make a real difference. We've actually just started this research and we already published 21 papers and abstracts simply on um, what we're seeing in the brain and how it correlates to other uh, risk factors. MSK has been a really interesting area for us because everyone has MSK findings in whole body MRI. Um, and uh, ever since we opened in Silicon Valley, actually we noticed that the average age of a spine that we image here in Silicon Valley, if I asked a radiologist to age the patient, it looks 10 to 15 years older than their biological age. So we're very nervous that um, the sort of changes that we're seeing in the spine of patients in their 30s are going to translate potentially in their 50s, 60s, 70s to um, you know, symptomatic disease, uh, advanced disease progression and potentially impacts on mobility. And as we know, longevity is so intricately tied to mobility. And so just being able to use AI to identify very subtle changes in curve angles or disc desiccation or vertebral heights and things like this, we believe are going to help enable us to make much earlier interventions that can potentially change the progression of these diseases. Uh, and then finally, we're starting to do uh, a lot of volumetrics around organs, joints, muscles, and other features in the body. Um, and again, these also enable us to really get advanced um, warning signs, particularly for metabolic disease, which we know is such a huge burden on the health system. Uh, we're now measuring, uh, we're able to measure changes in liver fat to do decimal points. We're able to measure changes in visceral fat, pericardial fat, 
um, subcutaneous fat. And although I would say these are very active areas of research for us, so we haven't yet quite tied the dots between what we are observing and the clinical progression of, degree, of disease, we're really excited about the potential to be able to do, do so. And if I step back, really the goal here is can we generate from all of this data something of a normative aging curve, organ by organ? Uh, and so uh, we can see each of us as individuals where we are on that curve. And what we've learned anecdotally from having imaged tens of thousands of patients is that all of us are ahead or behind on some of these dimensions. And these often relate to both um, lifestyle and also genetic factors. So finally, um, what's the potential of um, whole body uh, MRI for precision medicine? So here, we are starting to believe that there's real potential here for this to be an efficient and extremely high yield modality of medical examination. Um, although every uh, scan itself is expensive and we, we aim to bring the cost down, the coverage the, of, uh, of organs and symptoms that we're able to cover means that for any one particular screening, it's quite, it's quite inexpensive. Because the patients are presenting in a, a, typically in an asymptomatic fashion, it also means necessarily the way we approach radiology is individualized and risk stratified based on patient medical history and what we see. So it, it, it lends itself very naturally to precision medicine. And then finally, and most excitedly for us, I think, is there's a lot of focus on whole body screening and maybe a lot of the questions are, will this increase the cost of care? Um, and what we believe is exciting is we're able to catch a lot of these conditions so early, particularly chronic conditions, that the most sort of the most normal um, recommended course of action is lifestyle modification. And the hope and promise of these technologies is that we can actually um, avoid many of these medical conditions ever ending up needing to be treated by the health system. Um, I have one minute remaining, so um, pass in sort of true TED talk style, um, sort of a hope and a ask for everyone in the audience. So on the hope side, I think um, what's very interesting, one of the obje objections we get a lot, um, both from patients and physicians is, well, what happens if patients, will they freak out if they know a lot about their health? Um, you know, how will they take it? People don't necessarily want to know. Um, and I think for us, philosophically, that's sort of a reflection on the health system that we've built to some extent, um, that the reason disease is scary is because it's most often caught very late. And our hope for these technologies and, and the other technologies that we're hearing from today is that collectively, you know, we'll be able to redefine in some ways the definition of disease from something that's scary, reactive, advanced, difficult to treat, um, low probability of success to something that is more sort of akin to the maintenance of the engine of an airplane. Um, it's early, it's preventative, it's easy to fix, high probability of success, and often fixed by lifestyle changes rather than medicine. And then finally, an ask, we're collecting so much data, so we're really excited to um, partner with as many people as possible to really help us uh, go through this, identify new biomarkers, and potentially move the field of medicine forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Lacey. And now for our next speaker, in the interest of time, I will shorten the uh, introductions. Um, Dr. Karina Marie Aparizzi is a clinical professor in radiology at Stanford University, and she is also director of the Targeted Radionuclide Therapy Program in the Theranosics Clinic, also at Stanford. Thank you, Jason. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's really an honor to be here and, and an honor to honor Sam. Uh, San Gambier. I had the privilege of being um, one of his residents. I consider uh, him my mentor, and, and he's definitely missed every day. And I am here to talk about um, theragnostics within this session of precision monitoring and treatment. And I would like to start uh, with a patient, because as Dr. Lambier used to say, we are here at the end of the day doing what we are doing for our patients, right? So let me introduce you to Mr. X. Mr. X is a 58-year-old male that was diagnosed in 2017 with a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor and liver metastasis. And they told him, 
if we have this extensive surgery done, I think we can cure you. So Mr. X had this extensive surgery, had a scan after surgery, recovered for surgery, everything looked good, there was no residual disease, there was nothing new, and Mr. X thought that he was cured. And he had another scan, and nothing showed up, and Mr. X hoped and thought that he was cured. Eventually, he had a follow-up scan that showed new metastatic disease in the liver and two soft tissue nodules in the abdomen that were thought to be possible implants and maybe peritoneal disease. And Mr. X was devastated. How could he have new malignant cells from the same tumor that was now out of his body? Obviously, those cells were there at the time surgery was done, but they were so small that we were not able to see them, right? So we have masses that grow from maybe one or two single cells, because that's what malignant cells do. They replicate and replicate. So in reality, it's not that he was cured. In reality, it was that we were not able to have enough sensitivity to detect them. So he was placed on systemic therapy, uh, on chemotherapy, and uh, he developed such a significant toxicity such that he had to leave the treatment. Toxicity from the good cells of the body, not from the bad cells of the body. At that point in time, there was no guidelines that suggested what was the next line of treatment. And the patient was presented on tumor board and basically was told to him, nothing clear, whatever works for you. The patient decided to have additional surgery if possible, but surgery said, we don't think you are a good candidate. You have four large lesions in the liver. They are not in a good place. It's affecting the hilum. And also you have disease outside the liver. So we cannot provide surgery to you. One of the options that was presented to Mr. X was to come to the diagnostics clinic and have one of the therapies that we provide which is called PRRT. And I had the pleasure of meeting with him. We had a very long consultation. And out of an hour plus consultation, I came out with basically three main concepts that I gathered from the patient that I could help him personalize uh, and meet his wishes if I could with this therapy. And that was, his goal was to be cured, he was willing to have a liver transplant if that meant cure, and he was really ready to think outside the box. So with that, and the fact that he had already recovered from the toxicities uh, from chemotherapy, I will tell you in a few minutes what happened with Mr. X. Because right now, I think that it's time to tell you a little bit about what we do within Theragnostics, because PRT, is one of the therapies that we do within Theragnostics. So Theragnostics is, is a word that is composed by Thera, the origin means therapeutics, and Agnostics, the origin means diagnostics. Theragnostics is a new field that is um, basically developing. The concept is not new, but there is now a lot of infrastructure, a lot of interest, and a lot of development within this arena. The goal of Theragnostics is to diagnose disease at the molecular level so that it can be treated at the cellular level, cell by cell. And in this way, it follows the principle, if we can see it, we can treat it, that you may have heard. So how does all this work? Very important for Theragnostics is to be able to find uh, usually a molecule that is very unique, specific characteristic of a disease that we want at the end of the day treat, which is usually a cancer. And therefore, for us, finding and identifying this molecule that we are going to call our molecular target is going to mean disease. The molecular target will be AKA disease. At this point in time, what we are going to try to do is to develop a probe. You remember Sam Gambier, the spice? We're going to develop a probe that we're going to introduce in the body of the patient. It's going to be our spy 
in a very sneaky way, is going to go cell by cell, trying to find that molecular target. It's not going to affect the physiology or the pathophysiology that we are going to be looking for. The patient is not going to have any symptoms. If we are able to add somebody or attach somebody to that probe that is going to emit a signal from the inside out that we can detect with a scanner, we are going to be able to have an image of the distribution of that molecular target within the body of this patient, whole body, real time. If you have been able to follow me, and now we use the same probe, the same spy, or a twin, and that we introduce it inside the body of this patient, but this time, instead of labeling me with somebody that is going to allow me to get an image and produce some diagnosis, I attach it to something that once inside the cell or attached to the cell is going to kill the cell. Then what I am going to do is the cells that I am seeing in my scan, I'm going to be able to treat them with the same spy. And if you agree with me, I'm talking about targeting only malignant cells that I am seeing with my diagnostic scan because this is, is AKA my molecular target, which is going to allow us, therefore, to minimize the casualties of the good cells within the uh, body of this patient, therefore minimizing toxicities and side effects. So in doing so, we are talking about a probe that is going to be a diagnostic spy, our diagnostic agent, as well as our therapeutic platform for delivery of the treatment. So what can this spy carry to signal, to diagnose, and to treat, to get rid of the cell with a cytotoxic effect? Well, the reality is that the sky could be the limit. But the only thing that has made it to the clinic and that we do every day is the use of radioisotopes to be able to label the spy, the diagnostic spy, and to be able to treat the malignant cells. We can label uh, these spies, these diagnostic probes with positron emitters and be able to obtain PET images. Or we can label these spies with alpha emitters or beta emitters and convince these cells to undergo a program cell death through apoptosis and therefore disappear from the body of the patient with minimal casualties. And this is what we proposed to Mr. X. So we proposed PRRT, peptide receptor radionuclide therapy. It's actually FDA approved for the treatment of patients with neuroendocrine malignancies. That's what he had. He, then, he had a neuroendocrine pancreatic tumor. The molecular target for this therapy, for instance, is somatostatin receptors because they characteristically overexpress in these neuroendocrine malignancies. As a probe, um, what is used is an analog of the somatostatin uh, receptor, which is going to be attached to something that is going to emit the signal. And if this is a positron emitter, like gallium-68, I'm going to get a PET scan of the distribution of AKA, the neuroendocrine malignant cells of this patient, real time, full whole body. If now I use this Delta Tate and I label it with a beta emitter, like lutetium-177, which is going to emit a radiation with a penetration of about a millimeter, which is going to convince the nucleus of the cell to undergo apoptosis, I'm going to have a cytotoxic effect in this cell, and hopefully it's going to disappear from the body of this patient, minimizing casualties to the other benign cells. So, are these treatments that we provide through Theragnostics effective? So the answer is that actually, yes, they have very good results. And I'm just presenting, following the example of PRT, the Kaplan mayor curve that was presented to the FDA from the Netter one clinical trial when it was proposed to be um, FDA approved. 
And in this case, uh, that was a graph at uh, one year follow-up. Now there are five years follow-up. But at that point in time, you can see uh, the difference in progression-free survival that uh, PIRT had in patients with both different arms. Uh, compare that to some other therapies, like the one on the far right, um, erythelomas. Erythelomas is also a, a therapy that is provided to to these patients with uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, and you can see the difference at one uh, year time mark between um, both arms in progression-free survival. So very effective, especially in progression-free survival and preserving the quality of life of these patients. So the question is, do we have one of these diagnostic pairs, diagnostic and um, therapeutic part of the PAN for every single cancer out there? And the answer is no, actually, we don't have many therapies. As you can imagine, the stars have, have to be a little bit aligned so that we find the right molecular marker, the right biokinetics, the right pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, uh, and everything can um, make uh, it happen at the end of the day. But there is a lot of interest uh, within uh, academic centers with, uh, from part of the industry to be able to do more and more research um, to move it forward. But we can treat um, uh, thyroid cancers, we can treat neuroendocrine tumors, we can treat prostate cancer, which was the last one that was FDA approved and few more. So uh, the other thing that we can do uh, within the umbrella of theragnostics is to do those symmetry where we assess specifically for that patient and for that disease the amount of radiation that uh, is provided to the malignant cells and to good cells. For the malignant cells, we want to provide as much as possible so that they disappear. But of course, for the good cells, for the good tissues, we want to make sure that we don't reach a level of radiation that we don't feel comfortable with because we don't want to provide additional side effects. And therefore, the idea of personalizing radiation is very important for us uh, within the field of diagnostics. So now I'm ready to tell you what happened with Mr. X. So Mr. X decided to undergo PRT. And the first thing that we did was to do a diagnostic scan. So we did a PET scan with gallium 68.8 that showed us that the four liver metastases that he had were actually very well expressing of somatostatin receptors. We had a lot of target, therefore chances are he had a very high probability of response. And we also assess and characterize these soft tissues that were in the abdomen adjacent to the peritoneum, which did not express somatostatin receptors that had not changed in size from the beginning, and that whenever I tell you that he finished the treatment, again, didn't change in size, and therefore they were considered um, post-surgical uh, scar. So he has started PRT. PRT is provided in four cycles, two months apart, and we did those symmetry as we went through every single one of the cycle. And when he finished, we did another one of these um, um, monitoring diagnostics, gallium 68.8 uh, PET scan, and we saw a very significant reduction of the size of the liver. Patient wanted surgery, so we went to surgery, and the surgical team said, well, since the disease is only in the liver, this is looking much more promising. But we need additional shrinking of these metastases in the liver for us to feel comfortable. Well, we took advantage of the dosimetric studies that we did. And we saw that we, we could provide two additional cycles for the particular case of Mr. X, still not reach any threshold in any key organ, like uh, the kidneys for us, and he could receive it uh, and still go ahead for this additional shrinkage, which is what we did. Mr. X received two additional cycles. He had additional shrinkage. We showed this to surgery. We were only able at this time to find three of the initial, uh, initial four lesions. We presented this PETMR, and the surgeon said, um, yes, I think that we now we feel comfortable to go ahead with surgery. And in actually July 1st, 2022, Mr. X ended up receiving uh, a nucleation and wet resection of these uh, three liver lesions. And up today, 
pending, of course, the new monitoring scan, the new uh, dotted PET scan. He's considered this is free, and I'm happy to say that he's in the waiting list, in the waiting list for liver transplant, as he wished at the beginning of our consultation. So, do you think that we were able to help Mr. X with some precision monitoring and precision treatment when he decided to choose personalized diagnostic care? We want to believe so. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Aparici. And our next speaker is uh, Dr. Anna Jacklinick, uh, who is a principal research scientist and principal investigator at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in the laboratory of Dr. Robert Langer at the David H. Koch Institute for Integrative Cancer Research. Dr. Jacklinick. Thank you for the <clears throat> invitation to speak here today. Hopefully, my slides will uh, come up in a, in a second. So I'm an engineer by training and uh, a little different maybe than some of the other talks today. Um, my expertise is in materials. So if we go with the analogy of airplanes, I sort of build the engines um, that hopefully can enable better health care. And um, uh, personally, I have a, a, a really strong motivation to make healthcare equitable across the globe. Um, and I work um, a lot with the Gates Foundation in trying to um, develop technologies that can sort of help some of these problems that are um, affecting people in, in areas that don't have the privilege that we have with these uh, amazing healthcare systems that we have today. And that was a great example in the previous speaker about what can be done uh, in some of these wonderful cancer centers. Um, so today I'll talk about a couple of um, drug delivery technologies that, that we've developed um, to develop long-acting or um, self-boosting vaccines that can be applicable, as you'll see in a second, to various um, uh, diseases where multiple dosing is required. And I'll also talk a little bit about um, microneal-based delivery. I'm not sure if everyone is familiar here with that, but um, uh, your colleague, Joe DeSimone, is an expert in, in that area as well and has some in incredible systems coming out of his group. Um, and how we, we use that to, um, again, enable sort of decentralized drug delivery uh, uh, that we hope will enable decentralized drug delivery. Um, so I, I think I, I mentioned I have a strong collaboration with the, with the Gates Foundation. I think this slide, uh, one of the um, good things that's, that's come out of our pandemic um, is that we have great data, especially, and, and tools, actually, um, for some of the immunology work um, uh, uh, across the globe uh, and, and specific to COVID. And I think this really illustrates sort of the inequity um, in vaccinations. These are the, the, the vaccinations um, uh, data from the WHO um, site, I think, just from a couple of days ago when I put together the slides. Um, and, and a lot of things... Um, uh, cause this, my goal is really to focus on sort of the technical, uh, if you will, aspects that can be done to kind of ease some of that burden or some of that inequality. Um, and so, um, I, again, this, this project really started with, uh, and development of these tools started with uh, discussions with the Gates Foundation. And they wanted something very simple, which is, as all of you know, um, most vaccinations, especially the children ones, require multiple dosing. And um, the data at the time, and now we have even better data, is, is that many children in, in the order of millions die globally because, not because they don't get any vaccines, but because they don't get the full sequence of the shots required for the immune system um, to enable their bodies to be protective against those pathogens. Um, and so that was really the, 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 the simple concept that we were trying to address with, with this work. And the idea was, um, uh, what if we put the vaccine in particles? We're a materials lab and we are very good at drug delivery, um, but we realize that the kinetics of release, the kinetics that need to be presented to the body to develop an, immune, an effective immune response were quite different than some of the other drug delivery technologies that were out there. And what you see here on the left, um, and there's no pointer, what you see on the left is um, the way drug delivery has been done until um, for many decades, and us and others have published in the space, where your active, your API or the drug you want to deliver is distributed in that particle, either a microparticle or nanoparticle, that's then injected in the body, either IV or 
sub Q or, or um, IM, depending on the application. And the um, the, the issue with this, and it's, uh, there are several clinical products on the market, but the, the issue you have is the drug is distributed through this matrix, and so as soon as it's injected or hydrated, anything on the surface will be released. Um, and then you'll, um, so there's very little control or, the, or there's limited control. And then the, there's a second release stage which happens when um, the drug that's inside your particle diffuses, so it's, it's passively diffusion driven um, out of that particle. And so those two things um, unfortunately limit what you can do with um, drug delivery. And what we were looking for is, as all you know better than myself, is when you um, vaccinate or the idea of vaccinations is you want the antigen um, or the inactivated virus particle, um, you want that bolus or you want that sharp peak, and then actually you want some quies uh, quiescence in the body where the immune system kind of calms down and then you want to hit it again. And so this type of kinetics was very difficult to achieve um, with these particles. In, in addition, the ability to um, uh, uh, sort of use it as a platform where you could deliver different things, you have to reformulate, almost build a system build that engine from scratch every time. So um, I had a very simple, I'm a simple person, and I had a very simple idea. Well, why don't we try to create uh, just an, an eggshell type structure where you put the drug in the middle, you, your material is the shell, and nothing's released until that um, shell cracks. So that was the, 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 this very simple idea. Um, the issue was it was very difficult to create such a thing uh, where there's no leakage at all, because we're talking about molecules, whether they're biologics or even small molecules, and they're very good at getting through things. Um, so, so that was the, the idea, but we couldn't create this also for materials that were relevant clinically and able to use clinically, and also small enough that they can be injected through a needle, because we didn't want to change the mode of delivery. And so, um, we, we took, we failed a lot, and if there are any students here, we failed so many times, I can't even um, tell you. And we have re some really smart students at MIT. Um, but finally, we got it to work. Um, and we, we, when we did, we knew it was um, worth something, and, and it was published in, in Science later that year. Um, and so here's an example of, we developed a, actually a new process for making these tiny little particles. We actually borrowed from the microelectronics industry. Um, and so we, we ended up making cubes rather than spheres because it was easier. Um, so we make these little cups and then we use a piezoelectric, what you have sort of a printer um, that can fill your drug any drug really inside these particles. Um, and then we have a lid that comes on and seals the particles and essentially you can um, make particles out of any material that's a thermoplastic, not just the materials we've used there, and you can fill them with any drug that's either um, uh, soluble or suspendable in, in aqueous. And you could even do, now we're doing solid fill. This is an, an actual um, video. These are the actual particles. They're about 300 by 400 by 400 micron size, and you can see here we're just filling dye, but you can see the ability to really have a true platform where you can truly um, put anything inside these particles. Um, and we've shown that you can make these walls out of many different materials, ones that are pH responsive, um, <clears throat> ones that are degradable, and that's really where we focused. Um, for the most part. And so we focus on the library of PLGA materials. I'm sure a lot of clinicians in the room um, know these materials. They're used in resorbable sutures. They're used in surgical screws. Many medical products have these. Um, and even there was even a growth factor uh, formulation that was um, for ch approved for children that had this material part of it. Um, and um, we can make these in large arrays, just like if you think about microelectronics. So on a, on a histology slide, we can make about 1,500 particles. Um, <clears throat> and I, I think this is really the, the most relevant. These are sort of the different engines that we can make with these particles. What you see here on the left is um, release connect. So each vertical is a burst from these particles in vivo. And so by controlling the chemistry or the, the, the wall of those particles, which is completely independent of your drug or formulation, we can release things on the order of days to weeks and even out to months. Uh, this is a six month time point and you, you get very nice release and you get no leakage uh, until that point of when the material rele releases. The, the, the mode of action is hydrolysis, so a water molecule degrades the material and then releases. 
um, and it degrades into lactic and glycolic acid. Again, FDA approved, um, huge record of safety, both in infants, children, and adults. Um, so it's really a wonderful platform to deliver things. And I'll show you some of the examples um, where we've used this. Um, and I'm going to go really quick, but um, what I want to show here, and there's some more engineering about how we make these um, in order to stabilize the molecules in vivo for months, uh, days, weeks, and months, as you can imagine for biologics, that's, that's um, quite challenging. Um, and two, there's also a drop in pH when these particles break apart, they degrade into lactic and glycolic acid. So there's other ways that we mitigate that as well. Um, but here's an example. This is with um, a inactivated polio vaccine. This is a nanoparticle, about 27 nanometers, that we're delivering. It's formaldehyde inactivated, um, and it has polio has three different stereotypes. So it's really three types of vaccines. We created a system that can release the drug at one and two months post injection. Um, and in this case, the the red lines. This is in the rat model, uh, which is the polio model, and the, the data. These are neutralizing antibodies done by the CDC. And you can, if you compare the red to the black, the black is the control, which means each animal received three separate injections, and the red is just one injection of our um, microparticle seal system. Um, and you can see that we get very strong responses, neutralizing antibody responses uh, for all three serotypes. And in fact, um, they actually peak much sooner, which we weren't expecting. Um, and again, we're now looking at the immunology to really understand why our particles uh, are, are um, uh, stimulating the immune system earlier than, um, uh, than the bolus injections. But nonetheless, very nice data. We've shown that we can do this with many different things. Here is an example of um, hepatitis B vaccine. This is a recombinant protein. This work was done with CPG as the adjuvant. Um, and again, in this case, there's two soluble injections at zero and one month. And again, you can, you can see the multiple black is two injections. The red is one single formulation in our particles. And again, we have very nice data in, in the mouse model. Um, this is now in non-human primates. Uh, polio work, I should also say, is, has completed non-human primates just now. And, um, uh, at least the initial results show very nice immune responses as well. And then the other is these particles, they're actually, once you fill it with your active, uh, whether it's um, a, a drug or a vaccine or, or any other type of biologic, um, it, it's dried. So it's actually a solid form. And we actually get really beautiful stability for most of them at both room temperature and, and, um, and four degrees C. So again, another, um, <clears throat> Uh, another advantage to these particles. And, and so this is just an example of all the <clears throat> different things in, from the vaccine area that we've done in these particles. Um, a lot of people want to know how many particles do you have to give. So um, it can be for a rat or small animal studies, it, it's very few particles. And then for non-human primates, it's usually, which get a dose you know, closer to the human, it's about 200 or so particles. They're powder kind of like flour, they're smaller than the grade of sand, and they can be injected um, uh, just using uh, maybe a more viscous saline. Um, anyway, and now we're also working with mRNA. Uh, we're using COVID as the model to really show that we can do um, long-term delivery of, of mRNA and stabilizing it in the body. Um, <clears throat> we've also done work, again, this was published in Science Translational Medicine where we show that um, we can um, uh, deliver immuno, uh, immunotherapy drugs, such as the sting agonist, using our particles. And again, the goal here in these studies, initial studies, has been just to show that our technology enables just less shots or um, the, the need to less injections. Um, we worked with several uh, rodent models um, in this particular paper, and for the sake of time, I don't have time to go through all the data, um, but um, happy to discuss afterwards. You know, we demonstrated great efficacy and safety in, in all of these models. Um, we also show that um, we had really potent local and systemic responses, inhibited tumor growth and prolonged survival, equivalent to or better than multiple injections. Um, and we also show that the technology had an advantage in that we could inject directly into a tumor um, or in different areas, uh, in some of the hard to reach tumors in, in general. We also had in the metastatic model, we, we showed the, the 
um, <clears throat> contralateral one for melanoma, we show that we could decrease the risk of metastatic cancer developing if the particles were used instead of the multiple injections. Um, <clears throat> so I'll switch really quickly. In, in a minute, it's going to be, have to be fast, but we just published in, um, uh, a month ago in, in Nature Biotechnology a way to do decentralized microneedle production with mRNA vaccines. Um, and, I, and again, I, th I think we all know the, the issues with um, <coughs> vaccine equity and getting vaccines to different parts of the world. And the idea here we are really was to um, be able to create some things on demand um, and decentralize it so that you could ship these to places like a refugee camp in Turkey that just went through a, a giant earthquake, or you could ship things um, to part of Africa where there's an Ebola outbreak, um, and really quickly vaccinate the local population. Um, and the key was to take microneedle. Uh, microneedles are these little devices that can have you know hundreds of needles on the. Um, uh, in about a one centimeter diameter, um, but turn it into literally a printer. Um, and that took, again, a lot of engineering to be able to make something in a, in a smaller, without the classical manufacturing equipment. Um, and the key was this sort of um, how you fill the molds, which are kind of like ice trays, that make the microneedles uh, in these printers. And so we worked out that engineering. And again, this is published, and I can talk more about it. But I'll, um, and this is an example of how the different components in the printer. Here you see the ink getting filled into the, into the needles. Um, and again, in this case, our ink was the mRNA LMPs. Um, and we developed sort of a polymer solution that's able to stabilize these in solid forms in the, in the microneedles. Um, and again, uh, a lot of engineering here. And um, I, again, highlighting really the key aspect for bioactivity of that um, mRNA LMP instability. And I'll just jump um, to the end to show that um, not only that we have much improved stability compared to the liquid formulations that you would naturally get, but we also had equivalent immune responses um, in animals to a COVID vaccine, whether it was administered IM, so this is the liquid classic one versus the microparticle-based um, uh, administration. Um, and not only that, but um, this is a little irrelevant now, but um, we had very good responses to the different variants equivalent to the IM injections. Um, and we also had um, very good stability. This is after three months at room temperature, the patches were held and then administered to the animals. And again, we had very um, good data. And finally, on my um, last slide, uh, we published some papers in this space, also in science translational medicine, and we have a couple of papers going on now. Another thing that we can do with microneedles is we can encode information, or we deliver quantum dots, um, which can um, encode billions of bits of data, um, and they can be administered to the skin. They're completely invisible, and we can deliver drugs with this. We can deliver LMPs and other things, um, and we're not currently using it to sense, but that's something that um, is certainly of interest to us. So if there's interest in, in collaborating, but we deliver these dots, they, they remain in the skin uh, and they, they form a certain pattern. And so potentially they could be functionalized in a way that you could pick up some signals from, from that space. So I just wanted to kind of throw out there. And then just to um, thank the absolutely wonderful team of, of people that I work with, um, at MIT, they're, they're really the, the superstars of, of all of this work. So I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Jenikli. And our last speaker for the session is uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Michael Aldridge, <laughs> um, uh, who is CEO of Foco Medical and uh, has extensive experience in North America, Australia, and, um, and Europe. Good morning. Um, and thank you very much to both Gary and Joe and all of you for the, the opportunity to uh, introduce Focal Medical to you. And Focal Medical is a business um, whose uh, vision is to, to revolutionize the way that, uh, that drugs are developed, uh, sorry, drugs are delivered by targeting uh, the site of action to dramatically change the way that therapeutic products work using very sophisticated uh, energy-based systems. 
And so just to give you a very quick overview of the business, um, we're building therapeutic products, precision therapeutic products, and we use active energy-based technologies to deliver these drugs. Our patented platform technology is the use of ionotophoresis inside the body, which actively targets and delivers drugs to the diseased tissue and nowhere else. It's a very broad, uh, broadly applicable technology platform where the more obvious candidates for, uh, for our te technology are inoperable cancer tumors. But then we also have some very interesting work going on in uh, the delivery of genomic medicines generally. We're a, uh, we're a private entity, venture-backed, um, funded by Coastal Ventures, and have invested around about $20 million in the business to date. Um, our most recent financing uh, was our Series A, where we raised um, $11 million at a uh, $22 million valuation. And just as a general statement, to kind of set up the, uh, the opportunity for our technology, um, you know, the predominant approaches to delivering medications in this industry uh, are the oral and parental routes. Incredibly convenient. Um, they benefit from all of the sort of the convenience and compliance uh, that that entails. But in certain situations, there are some significant hurdles that limit the, uh, the, uh, the potential of these technologies, either through first pass or, or other forms of metabolism as the drugs go through the GI tract and through to the liver. Um, of course, they're systemically delivered. They're going to have targeted activity, but they very well have off-target activity. In the case of many of the oncologic drugs delivered systemically, um, the limit to getting the sufficient quantity of drug into the body is the dose-limiting toxicities that occur. And you're typically reliant, in the absence of any targeting mechanism, on uh, passive drug uptake. It's circulating in the system, and it gets picked up um, generally and has therapeutic effect where it's need to, but you are relying on a passive mechanism in that case. An optimal solution, again, generally, would be if we could get exactly the right amount of drug to the diseased tissue, actively penetrating the diseased cells, and have that drug go nowhere else. And that's the essence of what focal medical technology um, is all about. We are uh, implanting ionotophoretic systems inside the body. It's not through the skin, it's not through the eye, it's not through the nail. These are implanted inside the body and are used to actively deliver therapeutic products targeted solely to the diseased tissue and being delivered using non-blood pathways. And so in contrast to that it's systemic approach where it's very much an on or an off, we have a technology where it's directly on top of the diseased tissue inside the body, and we have an, a, a large number of different levers that we can pull to adjust exactly where the drug gets to, how much of it gets there, how far it goes in, and then we can turn it on and we can turn it off. And it's all built on relatively um, well-developed set of technologies. We haven't been, um, you know, sort of breaking into new areas uh, fundamentally. At the margin, absolutely. The engineering here is extremely sophisticated. But uh, ionotophoresis as a technology has been around a long time. It's traditionally been used in transdermal applications. We're the first people to take it inside the body. And you can see on the left there, that image is showing you a small reservoir with a skirt around it that we use to suture the reservoir onto the target organ, the electrofluidic controller that's attached to it that carries the drug into the reservoir across the, uh, the anode or the cathode, depending on how the technology is set up. Um, and then it exits the body to the power controller. And the power controller is the, the essence of how you modulate um, the delivery of drug to the target organ. And so there's a, a number of mechanisms that we can utilize to make sure that this drug gets to exactly where we want it to get to in exactly the right concentration and nowhere else. And it's both around the physical form factors of the drug, uh, of, the, of, the, of the device, um, but also the various power 
and time and drug concentration um, uh, uh, levers that we can adjust to make the system work uh, exactly as you need it to. And so to focus that in just a little bit more tightly in terms of exactly how anatophoresis works, you can see the reservoir on top of the disease tissue and the, uh, and the, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the anode sitting on top and the return electrode on the bottom and the external power supply and setting up a very focused electrical current which drives the drug directly out of the reservoir under that, the influence of that flow of current, dragging the drug and pushing the drug directly into the target tissue and again, nowhere else. And as you can imagine, there's an enormous area of potential application for this. The lowest hanging fruit is clearly in the uh, solid tumor area. What we're looking for here, because we're not going to treat metastatic disease, so we're generally approaching locally advanced non-resectable tumors where systemic chemotherapy isn't terribly effective and the unmet medical need is either represented by the fact that the disease is just so devastating um, or there's a functional importance to tissue sparing. And that's certainly in the case in things like oral cavity cancer where you're wanting to protect your vocal cords or um, perhaps glioblastoma um, as obviously a very serious brain cancer where tissue sparing can be an important part of maintaining, you know, cognitive effect. We also have applications in genomic medicine where the challenges here are really quite different. But because we can deliver these genomic medicines directly and specifically to the target organ by non-blood pathways, we avoid a lot of the metabolism that typically breaks down these uh, genomic medicines in the, in the liver and results in their inability to get to the target organ. And so avoiding immunogenicity improving safety and addressing payload issues are important parts of the way this technology works. But let me focus in on our lead program, which is in one of the most devastating forms of cancer, um, pancreatic cancer. And here we're delivering using inotophoresis gemcitabine to treat this disease. And just very quickly, pancreatic cancer is a devastating diagnosis. It affects something like 60,000 uh, people a year in this country. Um, on diagnosis, close to half of those individuals are diagnosed with metastatic disease and a very, very aggressive cancer. Um, that's not a part of the world that we work in, but it's obviously uh, an area of significant unmet medical need. The area that I want you to focus in on is on the right-hand side of the graph here, where we're looking at both resectable forms of cancer, which are typically treated obviously with resection. It's the best thing that you can do for the disease. Um, but there are also types of pancreatic cancer which are generally described as locally advanced and non-resectable. So they're still present in, in the pancreas and only in the pancreas, but because they have invaded the local and important organs around it, they are no longer resectable. There will be too much damage to the, uh, to the surrounding organs if you resected them. And that represents quite a large portion of patients uh, who have this disease or are diagnosed with this disease. And it really paints the, uh, the opportunity for us. There is uh, obviously a lot of unmet medical need generally in pancreatic cancer. But if I just focus you in on the difference in five-year survival rates as between patients who are diagnosed with resectable forms of this disease versus locally advanced non-resectable forms of this disease, you can see that there's a dramatic difference in, um, in the number of patients that will survive for a five-year period. And so when you think about our technology and the opportunity that we address, we're very focused on strategies to restage patients to surgical resection. If that's what we can do, you know, we've dramatically changed the way that a tech product like gemcitabine works in this setting. And to give you an idea of how our technology is set up, on the left you can see the pancreas, uh, the tumour that is present in the middle of the pancreas there and invading the local organs, the, the veins and arteries um, that make the, the tumour non-resectable because it has invaded those organs to that extent. It's still local at this point. We've implanted the, uh, our device right on top of it. There's the electrofluidic controller that comes outside your abdomen and then circles back to a return electrode that is on your back. 
and with the application of the power, of power through the power controller, uh, and then with the, you turn on the, uh, uh, the infusion pump, we're able to deliver gemcitabine in through that line, and the electric current pushes the gemcitabine out of the device and directly into the target tissue, and again, nowhere else. It's a very precise way of delivering a chemotherapeutic agent. And on the right, I'm just highlighting um, some work that we did very recently, uh, because obviously one of the biggest challenges that we have is just the, uh, uh, the quite significant surgical burden that we carry up front here. Uh, but this is two laparoscopic surgeons implanting our device into a pig using laparoscopic surgery. It's a, a much less invasive technique than obviously open surgery. And you can see the device being sutured there right on top of the, the animal. This is just before we've initiated our GLP studies, um, which are now ongoing as we're heading towards filing our IND with FTA for this technology. And there are many resistance factors that gemcitabine faces uh, as it attempts to, to treat pancreatic cancer tumors. But just to highlight one is the, uh, the fibrotic stromal tissue that tends to um, build up around these, uh, around these tumors. But if you have a technology that utilizes non-blood pathways and is able to um, get over these, uh, these fibrotic hurdles, you know, we have an opportunity to have the drug actually penetrate the tumor penetrate the cell and deliver its therapeutic effect in a much more focused and effective fashion than it could if you tried to deliver it systemically. And this is the sort of um, impact that we can have. I'm going to show you two slides here. The, the, the first really deals with gemcitabine and where it gets to in the case of inotophoretically delivered versus systemically. And you can see the plasma concentration in, on the left, the uh, data that's in red is the IV delivery of gemcitabine. It's dramatically higher systemically, of course, than IOP delivered gemcitabine. In the center, the tissue concentration, we get tenfold higher concentrations of gemcitabine in the target tissue than you can achieve by systemic delivery. And on the right, you can see that the gemcitabine gets into the pancreas and it penetrates full thickness. And this is the sort of impact that it has therapeutically. We're looking at a mouse model here. It's a xenograph pancreatic cancer mouse model. Um, and I'm highlighting it with no treatment, either IV or device, just with saline. Um, you get the typical progression of this disease, 700% growth in tumor volume. Gemcitabine does retard growth. These tumors did get smaller in this particular study. But the really dramatic impact that the delivery of gemcitabine using inotophoresis had was that every single tumor in every one of these mice shrunk to a quite a dramatic degree, on average 40% over the course of this treatment. And so the vision that we have for this product is that perhaps gemcitabine is actually quite an effective anti-cancer agent. Its activity generally has been limited by the fact that it's been around a long time. It's dose-limiting toxicity and these various tumor resistance factors that have impacted its ability to treat pancreatic cancer. And so we've demonstrated with IOP gemcitabine that you're able to get a very high concentration in the pancreas, again with little systemic exposure, and dramatic reduction in tumor volume. Looking at the graph on the right, if we can achieve that same sort of tumor reduction, volume reduction, in patients with locally advanced but non-resectable tumors, would we be able to open them up to resection and therefore a much better five-year survival rate. And just finally, in the last couple of minutes here, I want to highlight something that we've um, done very recently. This is just in the last couple of weeks, and I think today's the first time that we've uh, 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 presented this publicly, um, but we've been able to deliver um, nucleic acid medicines in a naked format using our antiphoretic technology directly into perfused kidneys, in this case, pig kidneys. And what we're trying to address here is the significant challenges that face um, genomic medicine, gene therapy, the delivery of siRNAs, mRNAs uh, in this industry. The fact that when you deliver them systemically, they tend to go directly to the liver. They tend to get chewed up very quickly. They have all sorts of challenges around tissue targeting that get addressed by things like uh, 
viral vectors and lipid nanoparticles. Um, we're trying to avoid all of that by direct implantation of our technology right on top of the kidney, pushing in these sRNAs which are otherwise unprotected and unmodified and delivering this um, downregulation of, uh, of, uh, of the target gene. Again, this is data which we've got a lot of work to do, but it's very promising at this particular stage. So with that, I'll say thank you very much indeed, and uh, just leave you with that uh, final idea. So maybe we can start, um, and we'll, we'll ask some initial questions, but feel free to also uh, come to the microphones as well, or uh, someone will come to you if you have any questions for any of our speakers. Um, so maybe we could start with Mr. Aldridge, since you just gave your presentation. Thank you so much for that. Um, so how do you do your patient selections for, for the ionophoresis? Yeah, so patient selection for our technology generally, let's just think about um, inoperable tumors. You know, our technology is relevant, obviously, to solid tumors, not um, blood tumors, um, and to locally advanced um, uh, tumors which would otherwise benefit from, from surgery, but for whatever reason, surgery is, uh, is, is not an opportunity and are highlighted in the, in, in the presentation either because of quality of life issues or, or life expectancy issues, issues. But a good example is glioblastoma. Um, another good example is the vocal cords you're looking to protect uh, or salivary glands you're looking to protect and head and neck cancers. But the, um, the most obvious and, and lowest hanging fruit is pancreatic cancer. Um, the tumor has invaded all of the local um, vasculature and arteries and veins, and as a consequence, you are unable to resect it. And so our choice or our target for our technology in that case is the locally advanced non-resectable, and our goal is to shrink those tumors away from the, uh, from the artery and vein in a way that would allow you to then resect it um, and ideally dramatically improve therapeutic outcomes. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Jack, Jack Clinic, I'm sorry, I, I apologize. Jack Clinic. Jack Clinic. Um, so with, with the microneedles, um, how do you think that we would be able to um, improve the uh, delivery to the different uh, areas of the world that you mentioned, um, be able to implement them better uh, at those sites? Yeah, so I think a, a lot of um, areas that are remote they, uh, or don't have actually the infrastructure to um, even house vaccines. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, uh, at least the, the work that, that we've done, the idea is to sort of enable them to locally um, manufacture maybe the ink gets shipped, but then they can sort of manufacture and administer the vaccines locally. And so you can imagine that could, um, uh, you could do it in, in, in a small village that maybe you know, has electricity and things like that. And then they have good stability. So then you could take them to even remote areas, mm -hmm. maybe within a certain number of miles within that location. And so you could have these satellites, if you will, mm -hmm. um, that enable distribution and administration of, of the vaccines or anything else for that matter that you want to deliver through through the micro -deal. I think that's the idea to decentralize um, where um, for areas where there's no infrastructure. Right. And then with a network like that to reduce cost as well to make it scalable. Yes, for global health, I think the, the cost is, is always a, a huge issue. And when you talk about vaccines until the recent pandemic, cost was always a very good issue. And, and I think it, it, it's going um, to, it, it still is to, to some extent. And uh, so making things affordable and the microneedles we make are made basically from sugar. Mm -hmm. um, so, it, you know, low, low cost components and yeah. And, and, and to add to that, I think, what we're trying to do with the printers is also enable perhaps some labs and scientists in those countries to also do research with mRNA LMPs uh, since that area has just exploded. So we, we think that this will enable a smaller lab, again, without the infrastructure mm -hmm. to and equipment to do. They could now do research in this space right. um, uh, with a smaller unit that they can manage. Great. And Dr. Aparizzi? Um, so with, uh, with Theranostics, um, how do you see the, 
the new cyclotron facility that's being brought here at Stanford will be able to uh, implement that and also expand that here at Stanford and elsewhere as well. Yeah, I think that uh, that will be fantastic and that will contribute significantly to, to expand it. Um, you know, in our field, um, uh, we evolve very fast and uh, we do um, plenty of, of scans every day uh, and our cyclotron <laughs> is used significantly for that. So we, we need um, uh, to have a, a, a cyclotron that is more state of the art and uh, it's going to be able to be more dedicated to, to the research because we need basically one dedicated to the good clinic. And remember, diagnostics is 50% of diagnostics, right? <laughs> so it's key for us to know what we are treating with very good diagnostics. Uh, it's going to be key to have a state-of-the-art facility, uh, facilities, solid targeting, um, to be able to develop isotopes that have already been testing in research and know that they are um, very useful, but also maybe more exotic isotopes that can uh, basically bring up um, very interesting research and uh, bring a, a community that would like to interact with us, maybe the industry, create all these collaborations. And of course, maybe we will start with, uh, with more diagnostic isotopes, but within the facility, the idea, of course, would be to also uh, integrate the second um, part of the diagnostic pair and also to be able to, to do the complete diagnostic pair, the treatment pair, and who knows, maybe down the road, we will be able to also do uh, therapeutic isotopes. We hope so. <laughs> um, um, sorry, I forget. I'm sorry. Mr. Lacey, Dr. Lacey. Mr. Lacey. Mr. Lacey. We're all, Andrew. <laughs> Um, how do you see the, with the whole body MR, and uh, we also now see whole body PET as well, mm -hmm. um, the cost of it and the scalability of it is probably going to be a challenge. How do you see that for whole body MR? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a few levers that we're sort of actively working on, and I think we'll see this in the industry at large. The first is diagnostic MR is still a relatively small space. Mm. And of course, like the use case of MR in a screening context may well be hundreds of times bigger. And, uh, and these, you know, every hospital has a couple of machines, every clinic has one machine, but there aren't large scale facilities with dozens of machines. Mm. And I think there's real opportunities to use scale to really bring down a lot of these costs. Um, the second is obviously the role of AI over time. And I think uh, AI is, again, beyond just potentially augmenting the work that radiologists do. I see a future of AI where perhaps it even is intervening real time in the imaging that you're doing. Mm -hmm. So whereas today we are imaging, we are following a single protocol for every patient that comes in, you could imagine a future where AI is perhaps just like you do a preview when you, <laughs> on, a, on a scanner uh, before you do the main, the main scan, we may well just use AI to help us understand which parts of the body to focus more time and attention on. And then through reducing the time it takes to screen people, reducing the workload on radiologists, we can also bring the cost down. And so our, our focus and belief is within five to 10 years, these scans can be in hundreds of dollars. Hmm. Uh, and therefore, obviously, much more likely to be adopted uh, by insurance companies and health system at large. And along that line uh, with PET and the diagnostics and MR, um, so we mentioned about PET-CT being standard now. Do you see whole body PET-MR uh, being standard at some point or uh, even necessary? To be honest, I'm probably not the right person to answer that question. <laughs> I think in a diagnostic capacity, I can imagine it might make um, quite a bit of sense. But for us, we're so focused on, um, on really pushing the limits of MR because we know that this is a technology that doesn't radiate, doesn't involve injection of any contrast, and therefore is completely safe to be used longitudinally as often as you might need to use it. And so even in the context of parts, for example, cardiovascular health, now with MR, you're breathing, your um, heart is moving, it's obviously beating, we can't tell your heart to stop beating, we can't tell you to stop breathing. So MR is not fantastic at looking at the heart itself in great detail, but we're really trying to push the limits of research in these areas because we just believe that the promise of one scan 
that's completely safe, um, done longitudinally, can just uh, has tremendous promise for the health system. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And I guess so in the interest of time, uh, perhaps I can open the floor up to questions from the audience for any of our speakers. Uh, there's a question there. Do we have microphones? I have a question to uh, Dr. Janek. <clears throat> In your release, multiple release of formulations for a vaccine or drugs, what happens if there's an adverse reaction to the first dose? Can you retrieve it safely? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, right now, all of the work that we've done in larger animals um, and non-human primates has been a sub-Q administration. And you can certainly remove them um, in, in even rodents. You know, we could go in a year later and, and remove them, the ones that don't degrade. Um, you would have to. You could potentially try a skin punch, but you might have to make an incision, which obviously is not the, the you know, the patient probably is not too excited about that. But um, yeah, they're they're very stable. They they literally stay just the way they they look just the way they look when you make them. They don't migrate, don't you? No, they're um, because and they don't get. Um, they're about four hundred, you know, three to four hundred microns, and so they um, they generally stay at the site. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, uh, so Mr. Aldridge, uh, it's fascinating, uh, technology and uh, your vision. But I would just like to ask, considering that there are recent, really excellent results reported in the outcome of a hypofractionation target, MRI targeted a pancreatic cancer. Uh, that's one. Second, uh, they are now in diagnostics of lutetium CN99 uh, with excellent, now they are early, but they are really excellent results. And we know that diagnostics is the biggest part that I think is going to move forward for targeted therapy. How do you monitor, how do you see your tumor geometry when it's invasive? And how do you control for tumor geometry where in ready in targeted treatment today with MRI with excellent respiratory uh, triggering? Uh, we can really, I'm not a radiation oncologist, but I know the literature. Uh, how do you compare? You need to see incremental value where we at present don't have. So uh, let me just try and make sure I understand your question. I th we, we As are you are developing this technology, yeah. there are already great advancements in the treatment of pancreatic cancer, both with hypofractionation in radiation therapy, targeted by MRI, and with theranostics with lutetium CN99. So certainly, I mean, pancreatic cancer is an enormously, uh, it's a significant amount made it, and as a consequence, it's a very competitive field. There are all sorts of um, advances in many different areas. I don't think that discounts the potential for, for, for any one of us. Um, and in fact, my personal perspective is that if you're not in a competitive space, you're probably not in a very attractive space. And so um, I do think we're going to be successful. We built our technology on very validated platforms. As I said, we're orchestrating in a very sophisticated fashion um, technologies that have been around for a very long period of time. I suspect they're going to work. Um, and they will be competitive with other technologies, and I can't comment directly on those. You did ask a little bit about um, tumor imaging. Tumor and geometry. Tumor geometry. I mean, our surgical technique is relatively um, agnostic with regard to tumor geometry and where it is on the pancreas. Um, our surgical technique was developed to implant the tumor right on top of that central part of the tumor where it is most adjacent to the relevant 
venous and uh, arterial systems because that tends to be where the complications occur that make, um, that make uh, pancreatic cancer locally advanced and non-resectable. So we're not targeting the tumour, we're targeting a region where the tumours tend to be more problematic and the way that you would then monitor tumour growth I don't think is relevant so much to our technology, although we certainly would love to develop a technology which we could build around our devices, which would allow you to image and monitor progression of the tumor uh, as a consequence of our therapy, because that would be the perfect world of targeted, tech, targeted therapy and uh, immediate monitoring and diagnosis. Do you have other questions from the audience? So we have a, a few minutes left, so maybe we can uh, have general question uh, for each of you. Mm -hmm. um, for each of your technologies, what do you anticipate uh, the vision of it would be in the next five years? Very short term, five years, what will your technologies look like? Maybe we can start with you, Mr. Lisi. Sure, so uh, I, mean, I think for us really, we're very hyper-focused on two things. One is uh, imaging as many patients as we can so that we can collect information, you know, more and more data on what's really happening in that sort of very unknown window in medicine, you know, where things are still quote unquote normal, but really it's just early disease progression. And I think as we collect more and more information together with AI, you know, my hope is that we're going to be able to redefine early disease progression and identify new biomarkers so that we can diagnose disease a lot earlier. And, um, and I see that all playing out over the course of the next three to five years. Thank you. I think that within the field of diagnostics five years from now, I think that one of the main goals and, and is happening as, as we speak is to, to be able to find more diagnostic pairs for, for more tumors uh, out there and more malignancies out there. Also, I think that we we will start thinking about different types of, of um, probes or of spies, right? We, we have been relying a lot on, on, on agonists, right? Because they, they, they bring um, the dose where we want. But also, there, are, there is also research now um, thinking about antagonists, right? Trying to maybe not get inside the cell that much, but to be able to take advantage of, of more of the overexpression, not necessarily the activated overexpression, and what that may, may bring and help in those tumors that are not necessarily genetically predisposed to overexpression, just expression of the target and help in that realm. And I think I also see more, more combination therapy. I think that one of the uh, key things that the diagnostics provides is, is of course, the advantage of targeting and, and the tolerability of, of the therapy, the decrease in inside effects. But maybe if we are able to find a synergism with the other types of therapies and still keep the toxicity at a good level, that would be uh, also beneficial for, for the patient. And, and the sky is the limit. I mean, we can get into epigenetics. And <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I hope um, this will enable people to have a choice, or patients to have a choice, to have a long-acting vaccine, whether it's for a pathogen or, or cancer. Um, and just the way when you go to the pharmacy, you can choose to have you know, the four-hour Tylenol or the long-acting version. So I, I hope, um, and, and I hope that will enable more people to get vaccinated. Again, it'd be wonderful if, if there were clinical um, cancer vaccines, and a lot of work is being done in that space. Uh, and I hope this will enable more people to get it because right now the clinical trials are showing, you know, nine shots, repeated shots um, for, for some of the cancer therapeutic vaccines. Um, and then the, the, the microneal work, um, you know, I, I, one of the ideas we originally had is that you go to a pharmacy and you print your photos and then at the same time you could sort of uh, print and, and order your... Um, uh, vaccine or whatever drug and just administer it to yourself on the skin, I think that would be um, 
really cool, if you will, for a scientific term. Um, and then I didn't talk about our, our work with um, on patient medical record, but that's sort of for you know, Trekkie fans. I, maybe that's more Caltech, but um, you know the, the tricoder um, uh, from, from Star Trek, where you could scan a body, and I think this is the work that you're doing. Um, and you could get all this in information, and so that's one of the things that we're trying to do with this on-patient medical mm -hmm. record, where you could have a decentralized, again, very um, quick diagnostic mm -hmm. um, with respect to some, some outcomes. Yeah. I think our audience understands that analogy. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Roger. So, um, you know, ours is a platform technology, and I think there's three things that I'd like to see um, in, our, in our company over the next five years. Um, within pancreatic cancer, we're moving into the clinic. I think in the next five years, we'll be well advanced in our pivotal trials, and I'd love to see a proportion of, um, of patients in our clinical trials enrolled with a very poor prognosis with locally advanced non-resectable disease being restaged to a resectable case. That would be a hell of an outcome, number one. The second would be to really fundamentally enable um, this very exciting area of gene therapy to demonstrate that we can organ specific directly deliver um, uh, various gene therapies uh, and down regulated target gene um, in a clinically relevant manner would be incredibly powerful. And the third element really gets to kind of the invasiveness of our technology. It's obviously quite a s serious surgery to have uh, one of these um, devices implanted. And so we spend a lot of time thinking about the ways that we can piggyback um, our technology on other catheters and stents and, and other systems that, that access um, parts of the body that are important for us in our therapeutic quest. And so developing technologies that, are, um, that have less of that um, upfront burden means that we can be more generally applicable in diseases that perhaps don't quite have the, the same degree of unmet medical need that pancreatic cancer has. I mean, that's just the poster child. And so we can be quite invasive, but there are many cancers that we'd love to get after with a less invasive technology. Mm -hmm. oh, we have a question here. Yeah, question. Um, first of all, terrific session. Uh, Andrew, as a multi-year customer of Pernovo, and, and I've really appreciated the, the vision of the company, and, and you made a pretty compelling argument, too, about uh, the opportunity and cost savings of this early detection, even though it, it's expensive. How do, you, how do you think about the business model for Pernovo, given you know, some of these broader opportunities? And, and as you look down the road, how do you, how do you really uh, scale what you're thinking about? It's a great question. <laughs> uh, I think about it every day. Um, I, I think, well, first of all, I mean, the question you might want to ask is, well, why have we not developed more preventative screening approaches as a field of medicine? So, uh, you know, we all watched Star Trek, you know, 50 years ago, and we're, I'm pretty sure 50 years ago, we were thinking we were going to get a device that would just scan for everything. And, you know, 50 years later, we have mammography, we have PSA, although some people don't necessarily think that's a good idea. We have low-dose CT for lung <coughs> cancer, in, but only if you're high risk and you smoked many years of your life. So we really haven't made any advances at all. And I think some part of that is rooted in, um, I think, a, uh, a sort of this reactive sort of view of medicine that we've all been sort of brought up with. And then some part of it is just that at the level of population, maybe the cost economics don't work for screening any one thing. And maybe the real unlock here is that if you can screen many things at the same time, that cost burden shifts. So I'll give you a good example. We do in our screening protocol, 55 minutes, we spend exactly, I think, 15 seconds doing an MRCP as we speak about pancreatic cancer. So I don't know, 15 seconds divided by 55 minutes multiplied by the cost of the scan means probably we're scanning for pancreatic, potentially uh, at least uh, ductally um, sort of tumors that might be blocking the pancreatic duct. We're screening those for what, $20? So um, I think maybe that unlock might be the key, sort of the, the very sort of conclusive um, sort of nature of MR screening. We can see so many things, maybe the unlock um, for screening more broadly in the health system. And that's what we hope to prove through 
sort of the clinical trials that we're running. Thank you. Yeah. Do we have any more questions from the audience? Oh, we have one question in the back. Just as a general answer, um, the smaller the molecule and the more charged the molecule is, the more amenable it is to the delivery by onotophoresis. That's not to say that we can't move around much larger molecules and uncharged molecules um, using the same technology. It's, it takes longer and requires different conditions, different electrode setups, different uh, buffer systems, different uh, surface areas. So not impossible, but always challenging. Great. Thank you so much. Let's uh, thank our audience one last time. I'm oh, sorry, our speakers one last time. <laughs> thank you, <Eddie. laughs>